Well, thank you, George, for accepting my invitation for a short interview. Most a, happy to do it. Yeah, for a 15 minute chat. And it's a really pleasure to actually have you in this. I mean, I was, as I said, I was quite shy to ask you. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. No need to be shy. Uh, thanks. And yeah, in, I just want to set up a timer. Like the format is I'm just going to set up a timer. And when the timer goes off, I'll just over. Say, thank okay. you. And we will just have a nice chat, I hope. Okay. I'm sure I actually. I do. think we will. So the one thing that I want to ask is more personal. I want to directly ask a personal question. How did I trick you into becoming my collaborator? How did you, you sent me yesterday? a really interesting problem that I could make sense of. I mean, I'm open. I'm open to anybody who writes me with an interesting problem. And a lot of people have. I have. I think I have well over 100 collaborators, so uh, I have uh, I have often found positive and and useful ideas that spur in me an interesting response, and so and you certainly sent me something that was fascinating, so it was a natural thing. And hopefully we'll get to the next thing too. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yes. And then, I mean, I want to ask, because I feel, I feel that I'm failing to be so. Uh, so what makes a good collaborator? So basically, I just think open to open, being open to new ideas. Uh, there are, I suppose, certain people who view, who are closed, say, to applications of mathematics or some branch of mathematics that they aren't familiar with, I'm happy to collaborate on anything where I can make a contribution. And uh, sometimes people write to me with a problem that either is far from my expertise or it's in my expertise but far from my ability to make any contribution. So I tr usually I try to respond quickly to someone who writes to me either sometimes I suggest other people who I think might do better or I at least say I'm really interested in this and I'm thinking about it and I will get back to you when I know something or if it's a problem where I know the answer immediately uh -huh. and it is some, so to speak in the literature yeah. I try to point them to to the appropriate things in the literature. So there are all sorts of things that are written to me about. Um, one of the most interesting, I think, was um, when, when I was doing papers related to Ramanujan's Lost Notebook, mm -hmm. uh, there were certain series that came up that seemed to me very unusual. And so <clears throat> in the 1980s, Richard Guy had a column in the American Math Monthly in which he basically did, so to speak, problems, unsolved problems. So I wrote a paper for him mm -hmm. and he basically said that this was, he was going to reject it because there was much too much of a theorem proof element to it. If I wanted to shorten it, he might consider it, but otherwise he would throw it out. So I shortened it, and uh, as a result, a number of people started working on it. Only only two people wrote to me about <laughs> about it: Dean Hickerson and Freeman Dyson. Yeah. And so that resulted in one of the most interesting collaborations. Uh, I found out later that at least. Two or three other three other mathematicians had worked hard on this problem, um, but uh, and one of them actually, in after everything was out, uh, well, wrote to me and uh, basically accused me of not telling everything I knew about this function when I posed the problem which was incorrect. 
the things he was accusing me of knowing, mm -hmm. I did not know at all. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I did not know at all, which may be a fault of mine, yeah. but I did not know them. And uh, he basically, this was basically a Q series in Ramanujan. He suggested to me that this was a modular form and that uh, he had a computer program which would basically figure out what it was. And strangely, at the end of his letter, he said that his program had uh, blown out the memory so that he was unable to. So he could have He could it. not find the modular form. And there is a very good reason he couldn't find the modular form is because it wasn't modular yeah. form. And therefore, <laughs> you're, not going to, you're not going to find it. Yeah. But uh, so there were sort of strange uh, responses to, to this problem. But... But in any event, anytime, anytime somebody writes to me about a problem, I'm interested, I try to respond, and so sometimes the responses are, as I say, I can point to the literature, or I, or I try to help, or I say, I, this is interesting, but I fear I don't have a vaguest idea of how to help. I, I have to say that you really respond fast, and it's no joke, but I mean, you know the literature really well too, and I mean, I feel like I'm forgetting some of the things that I have proven in, that are in my papers. Like, how do you keep all of his traits? Because, I mean, I have taken your advice before. That you said, like, look at this paper. And exactly in that one paper of some particular mathematician, it was the re result that I was looking for. Well, once you get to my age, one of the things you must be careful about is that you haven't published this previously 40 years ago. And so you have to think carefully about possibilities like that. Um, I, uh, I recall once a, a, a good friend of mine wrote to me and said, I've discovered some really interesting polynomials recently, and I wonder if you know anything about them. And I said, well, yes, I do. They are actually in your paper in such and such a journal. I see. So all of us make mistakes like that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure he didn't take it. <laughs> uh, well, he was a little embarrassed, but uh, you know, when, you're, happen, when yeah. you're doing lots of things, you can publish something and, and then it's put aside and you really, it doesn't sort of register in your memory. Sure, and you don't have information of like everything, yes, like yes. the Schmidt problem that I had no yeah. idea. Like yes, that's of Schmidt. course, yeah, of yeah. course. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe I can ask you about like you being the a former AMS president. Yes. How did that come about? And I mean, it's a big administrative job. How how did you keep on doing research? I mean, how did it? it so it's so research. It's not as big an administrative job as you would think. Uh, so it, before I was asked to run for the presidency of the AMS, I would say that it never occurred to me mm -hmm. at all to even, it, it didn't even cross my mind as something that might be in my future. I was actually visiting Florida huh. at, at, in my standard visit and Florida has a sufficiently uh, strange way of accessing phones that it's almost never the case that I ever got a phone call in my office. Mm -hmm. But one day the phone did ring and Arthur Jaffe, a professor at Harvard, who I know a little bit, uh, said, hello, this is Arthur Jaffe. I said, hello. He said, I suppose suspect you wonder what I'm calling about. And I, I, mean, and I thought to myself, no one has ever called me on this phone before. <laughs> and so the fact that a famous Harvard professor is calling me does surprise me a little bit. So I said, yes, I am curious as to why you're calling me. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm chair of the committee to select nominees for the presidency of the AMS, and we would like you to consider being a nominee. Wow. So I, uh, uh, I said I'd think about it, and so I then called up the executive director of the AMS to find out exactly what the job would be like, 
and he sort of gave me a whitewashed version of it so that it sounded much easier than it actually <laughs> was. Uh, and, uh, and so I agreed to run. And I think that the voter turnout in the AMS is fairly low. And I think if you are running against somebody whose name starts with a letter lower in the alphabet than your name starts with, you have an advantage. And so I think I got something like 52% of the vote. And I suspect that the I, winning advantage comes from the fact that I had, if I'd I, been, been running against a Lottie, I might have lost oh, because okay. his name would come first, but uh, I was I, not. I think you're underselling yourself right now, and that is definitely, I mean, yeah. Anyway, in any event, it was the, I think the most difficult part of it is that you were often involved with various committee meetings, mm -hmm. and so there were times when I felt I was flying somewhere every weekend. Uh, but uh, basically, I enjoyed it. I thought there were positive things I could accomplish, and most of the positive things that I wanted to accomplish were actually accomplished by other people, but I got the credit for it. And well, so that's, that's the way that's that country. that's the way things work <laughs> when you're president of an organization. And so anyway, it was a, a fascinating and, and interesting uh, uh, activity and uh, certainly a valuable experience. Yeah. And you said that you were flying everywhere, like almost every week. Yes. Uh, but I should maybe come, like, uh, just, uh, I should maybe mention that we saw each other at not uh, a, a place other than our home turf, that we are in Vienna now. That, I mean, I yeah. came from Linz, you came all the way from Pennsylvania yes. for this one conference to yes. be here together. Um, and I mean, sometimes actually flying pays off. I'm glad that I saw you and I saw all these talks, but maybe I want to segue to what do you think about? in-person conferences. I, I think they're really valuable, but I mean... So I think they're essential. Uh, I, I, so I have both attended conferences on Zoom and I've taught on Zoom. And my opinion is that if the choice is between Zoom and nothing, Zoom is superior. Uh -huh. However, Zoom is vastly inferior to in-person, both teaching in the classroom or 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 being at a conference. Con there are so many aspects of a conference that involve the personal interactions of, of the members of the, of the conference that, uh, that just the lectures themselves are an important part of a conference, but they certainly do not constitute the whole thing. Whereas when you attend a conference on Zoom, fundamentally the, the, the main talks are it. I, and yeah, I, and I feel the they way. better be really well prepared. And mm -hmm. as we both know, some talks are better prepared than others. Of and uh, so, Zoom, Zoom is Zoom is something valuable, but it is not a replacement for an in-person yeah. conference. And I always feel like whenever it's a not so well prepared talk on Zoom, I always feel like. I, the need to go to the kitchen. It's just <laughs> yes. Well, okay. I, I, you see, there's I, always the fridge. I fridge. confess to exactly the same, yeah. uh, the same feeling. Uh, but yeah. uh, but there are things that can be learned from a not so well prepared talk when you're actually there, <laughs> yeah, as opposed to when you really have no chance to communicate with the person who's yeah. who's speaking. So well, okay, maybe on like the last stretch of our uh, fifteen minute chat, I yeah. can ask you about all. The research and maybe even the lost notebooks of the romance right? yes like you are the one that actually found these lost notebooks and it must be really exciting to see them at first but it must also be a really huge task to even attempt to start from some place true both true so uh it was a complete surprise that i found the lost notebook uh i basically was in i was visiting Richard Askey at the University of Wisconsin mm -hmm. purely to do research for the year 1975-76. Um, I was invited to a conference in Strasbourg, France by Dominique Fouada, mm -hmm. which was to last one week. But at that time, the airlines had the following price 
rules. If you spent three weeks in Europe, the airline fare would be almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And if you spent less than three weeks, it would be Something. one over almost nothing. Okay, <laughs> So that, that there was a tremendous uh, incentive to spend three weeks. So I needed to figure out some way to justify being three mm -hmm. weeks in Europe. So one of the things I knew from Lucy Slater was that G.N. Watson had contributed many of his papers to the Trinity College Library in Cambridge. So I said I would like to examine Watson's papers. So amongst Watson papers were this 100 plus manuscript that was uh, Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. And I recognized on almost immediately what it was, not just that it was in Ramanujan's handwriting. I think that somebody had put on the top of it that it was something from Ramanujan. Uh -huh. But in the, I had written my PhD thesis on Mach theta functions. So the phrase Mach theta functions never appears in this manuscript, but the Mach theta functions are there. And these were discovered during the last year of Ramanujan's life. So you mm -hmm. know immediately that if you see these things, you know that this is what he wrote after he went back to India. Nobody had ever seen this before, or nobody nobody knew what it was wow. who had seen yeah. it before. And so it was a quite a moment. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it was. Uh, it must have been. But I mean. How big of a test, too? I mean, also, the 15 minutes goes by really fast, right? I mean, yes. I, I still want to ask this, yeah, but I mean... Go ahead. If I were to see such a big task, I would maybe sleep on it for three days and not, not to, couldn't even do anything. How did you handle, I mean, this being... So immediately test? after it, uh, so my wife and my, at the time, our daughters were very young. Uh -huh. We've had three children, but Derek was born later. So the, my daughters were six and four. Uh -huh. So I, we were there with two small children. And so after I was so excited, I said, let's go punting on the cam. So the punts are these long boats uh -huh. and one person stands at the back with a pole and you float down the river and it's very nice. And, and in 1960, when I was there as a student, also with my wife, uh -huh. we were married in 1960, uh, we punted on the cam several times so it's a really it's a wonderful thing to do but i now was a little rusty at punting so i got the pole stuck in the mud <laughs> and i fell in the water and, and uh, so this was sort of to i think uh, god telling me that you shouldn't be too excited about this i see <laughs> <laughs> i'm so glad that you shared <laughs> so that was that was the uh, that was the immediate event after that yes Yes. Well, thank you so much, George. Okay. Thank you for accepting to have this chat with me. Yeah. My pleasure. And I thank hope you, we Ali. will have a second one when we see each other again. Okay, good. Maybe in Pennsylvania next time. Wonderful. That would